Hey, what's up, guys? You're back with Mr. Abdul Wahab, and this is Hermes Test Prep. Today, we're gonna talk some more about the style and tone of writing for the SAT exam. Of course, you could use the same skill and concepts with your other kinds of examinations, especially when you have writing sections. That's really helpful. It is indeed the writing and language part of the exam on which you get asked questions like these, where you're required to edit, change, or actually keep the words as they are. Now, as we mentioned in the previous video uh, we really talk about style and tone when we talk about the formal and informal style of writing when we have a formal setting okay we tend to use a more formal way of phrasing our ideas when we are uh, speaking or writing for an informal uh, setting we tend to use a different way to voice almost the same ideas so let's take a look at the questions that we have so the writer wants to use exaggeration which is again an overstatement as we explained in the previous uh, video tutorial again an overstatement would be like uh, let's say again um, you lose your phone you say oh my god it's the end of the world well it's not exactly the end of the world I mean you're exaggerating that's an overstatement in order to emphasize the relative insignificance of a mistake which choice best accomplishes this goal so let's take a look my friend Joseph we are told has committed the oversight of forgetting to bring his homework to class now when you say he has committed the oversight basically he has forgotten to bring his homework uh, to class, when we say committed the oversight, it's not actually an overstatement. That's a very almost bland, uh, tasteless way of saying it. Almost no emotions whatsoever. So that's not exactly an exaggeration. So I'm gonna change it. Has committed the grave crime. Now we would uh, call murder, for example, a grave crime. So that's an overstatement. I like it. The inconvenient error. That's not an overstatement. Again, that's actually the, the proper way of describing it. Um, it is an inconvenient error or unfortunately made the mistake. Now, all of those, they have almost the same meaning. It's just that the grave crime really magnifies or exaggerates the um, the uh, offense itself or basically forgetting to bring his home. It, it exaggerates it. So that's a right answer. For the sake of rhetorical flourish. Rhetorical flourish means when you beautify a certain piece of writing. The author wants to use the same word as two different parts of speech. Basically, he wants to use the word in two different types of speech. That is, one time, for, for example, as a verb and another time as a noun, or one time as an adjective and one time as a noun, and that's using the same word. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? So she did not hate many things, although she disliked the very act of hating things. Okay, so again, she did not hate many things, although she disliked the very act of hating things. Now, here we're using uh, the word hating in almost exactly the same way where we used it here. Okay, so we haven't changed the part of speech in this specific sentence so she did not hate many things again we're using it hate here as a verb and then again we're using it again here as a verb although she disliked the very act of hating things so we're not really changing um, so she did not hate many things although although One, two, three. So she did not hate many things, although she disliked the very act of hating things. So now let's take a look at this sentence, okay? She did not hate many things, that's a verb, although she disliked the very act of hating things. Now here we're using the word hating as a noun. We did change the uh, part of speech. But however, we're not using exactly the same word. When we use the same word, we're using it exactly as it is to, to the letter. Okay? So, by adding the ing, yes, we did change the part of speech, but we changed the word itself uh, when it comes to the spelling, of course. So, I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna go with no change. I'm gonna check the other answers. So although she hated that emotion, so although she hated, here the word hated is again used as a verb, so that's not a change in part of speech, so B is wrong as well.
Except for that very emotion, we did not repeat the word here, so again, C is wrong. Except for hate itself. So she did not hate many things except for hate itself. So here we're using hate as a verb, and here we're using hate as a noun, and it's exactly the same word, no ing's, no s's, nothing is added, so D is the right answer. The author wants to use irony in order to communicate disapproval of the bad weather. So, which choice best accomplishes this goal? Now again, when you use irony, okay, irony as it is defined here, of course, is a statement that when taken in context may actually mean something different from or the opposite of what is written literally. The use of words expressing other than their literal intention, often in a humorous context. Basically, let's say you go outside and it's extremely cold and you say, oh God, it's so hot today. Now, uh, again, you're using the opposite words to, uh, to using words to convey an opposite meaning. Okay, so that's one way of using irony. Let's say someone uh, says something really stupid in class and someone says, hey, you're so smart. Again, that's use of irony. He doesn't actually mean smart. He actually means the opposite of smart. So let's take a look at this. According to the weather station, we should expect rain, hail, and an assortment of small pets to descend from the sky later this afternoon. Well, isn't this just a lovely forecast? Now, again, we're using irony or to communicate disapproval of the bad weather. We're trying to show that we dislike the fact that the weather is gonna be this bad. So the word here used is, isn't just it a lovely forecast, but they're expecting rain, hail, and an assortment of small pets to descend from the sky. That means that the weather is gonna be extremely bad. So by saying that it's gonna be a lovely forecast, that's actually using irony. I wouldn't call it rocky or fragile, easy to break. Fragile is easy to break, unpromising, None of those actually uses the irony that we want except for the word lovely. So, for the sake of rhetorical effect, the writer wants to maintain the pattern of repeating words derived from the same root. Again, we're working with root words. That is the base word, and then we add stuff to it. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? Attain the unattainable. Conquer the unconquerable. Clasp the unreachable. So... Again, we want to use it in the same sense where the base words are used in previous sentences. So attain, unattainable, conquer, unconquerable, clasp, the unreachable. Um, here, the base word or the root word has changed in both words. We want to find the option that will give us the same base word. Grasp what is out of reach. Again, not the same base word. Reach what can't be grasped. Not the same base word. Reach the unreachable. That's the same base word, so that's our right answer. Which choice best maintains the intent and pattern of the sentence? Let's take a look. You must be brave without foolhardiness, strong without violence, decisive with arrogance. Now, if you take a look at the previous phrases, you have without. is It's repeated twice. So, so our answer should contain without here as well. So I'm going to cancel all the options that give me with. So I'm stuck between B and D. So you have to be brave without foolhardiness, strong without violence. So you have, we have the posit positive word and then the negative one and without in the middle. So decisive without arrogance. Now that's, uh, that looks like the correct, the correct um, use of the word. And here decisive is an adjective, Ar arrogance is a noun. Okay, so if we look back, okay, you have to be brave without foolhardiness. And here we have an adjective and then a noun. Strong, adjective, and then a noun. So this really is looking like the uh, correct answer. Arrogant without decisiveness. Now here, arrogant is an adjective and then um, deci decisiveness is the noun. However, here we have the negative um, word first and then the positive one next. So this goes in contrast in contrast to the pattern established in the sentence. So I'm going to go with B for three reasons. It maintained the pattern, that is a positive word, and then the negative one. Uh, it used without, and also it used an adjective followed by a noun, exactly like the pattern established in the previous elements. So B is our right answer. So thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions or any comments, make sure you put them down in the comments section. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Make sure you 
share this video with your friends. See you soon on the next video.